He can take a mountain in your way so tall. Show you how he sees it and make it very small. Hi, this is Eric Elder, and I am with my friend Dennis Jernigan, and I'm so excited to spend a little time with him and share that conversation with you. It's been a while since we've caught up face to face like this even, and uh, so I'm really interested in that. I want to explore, Dennis, about your latest album. I want to talk about your latest book. And I want to ask you some questions about uh, dealing with unhealthy attractions. So we've got sort of a range of things, but uh, I, I, I'd, I'd like to give an introduction to you. But first, I just want to start with you and just, just uh, how are you doing today? How, how, how is life going into today? You can be honest. It doesn't matter. Well, uh until we started this meeting, life was going great. <laughs> <laughs> I love seeing your face. I love talking with you. I love being with you. It's just, uh, I'm struggling with Parkinson's. And when I come up against a glitch of any kind, like trying to join a Zoom meeting, when normally I, it's an instant thing and easy to do, uh, my brain goes into a mental state of just fogginess hmm. and it takes me a while to get over that so uh, if we, if there are any lapses between what i'm trying to say and a moment of silence just blame it on the parkinsons and that's what we do as a, as a family i blame everything on parkinsons and i get out of a lot of stuff so thanks for letting me know that and letting people know that it's uh, I read your book and I got so many insights into the disease and into how it affects you. And uh, this is, it sounds like a, a, a normal day. You can be going great and then you hit a roadblock and then it's just, it's it's debilitating in some ways, but then you bounce back. And I'm, I appreciate that you keep bouncing back and you've given me a lot of hope and joy just through reading your book. So thank you. And thanks I for being here, honestly. appreciate that. Uh, I have a choice in any situation. I I don't have a choice as to whether I have Parkinson's or not, but I do have a choice as to how I respond to it. And we've just decided, my wife and I, and as a family, that we're going to choose to see it from God's point of view and just basically practice Romans 8.28. Uh, we know that God causes all things to work together for for good of those for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and Parkinson's is part of that all thing so I'm going to use it for the kingdom mm. it doesn't have me I have it and so uh, it's going to do what I want it to do I'm going to use it for the kingdom that's all I'm trying to say Amen you have never been one to waste your pain have you <laughs> Nope I own it. <laughs> I'm no I'm no victim though. I'm not a victim, so don't hear that. I'm a victor. Amen for that too. Amen for that too. And the attitude makes all the difference. It's it's not easy, but it's it's doable and it's true. And we're encouraged to do it by God Himself and by Paul and by Jesus. And oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. He he knows we're gonna face stuff and and he says anyway, uh be joyful. Yeah, this didn't surprise God at all. Yeah, yeah. It surprised me. I was really uh, bummed to hear it, but I also was just praying for you and praying that God will walk you right through it. And I'm I'm still praying for healing and, and pray right now, Jesus, whatever touch you have, I pray you'd give it to Dennis. Just I receive it. Yes, Lord. We, we continually ask the Lord for healing and uh, are totally not opposed to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. in the meantime, I'm I'm going to have a joyful attitude. I'm just going to enjoy my life. I am. We've, we're four years, a little beyond four years down the road of, since my diagnosis. And uh, just a lot has happened during those four years that have taught us a lot about the nature of God and the power of his grace and the fact that it's Parkinson's is not a death sentence by any means. Uh, I plan to go down fighting mm. with a joyful attitude. I do. Mm. So I've continued to be creative 
and focus on my kids and my grandkids. And they're my first ministry, my wife and kids and grandkids. And then all the ex excess overflows to everybody else that we come in contact with. So um, we and just... You, and you've got a lot of excess. You've got a lot of overflow people that are with you and praying for you and thinking about you and you've yeah. touched over the years, me included. Well, I appreciate that. I yeah. hear from people all over the world who still, believe it or not, use the music regularly. Mm. I'm so blessed. It seems like every week I get a video from some church somewhere in the world using one of my songs. Uh, one of the most recent ones was from the Ukraine in the middle of their war with Russia. Mm. A church group singing, just a massive church group singing, You Are My All in All. Mm. And, in their language and uh, people literally all over the world singing the music. And I just got one last week mm. from a church in the USA, a big youth meeting, and they were singing my song, I Belong to Jesus. Mm. And it was like God's teaching the songs to a whole new generation. Wow. And the, my legacy is going to continue with or without me. So. Mm. And hopefully it all points to Jesus. So wow. Wow. Those things, those songs, you know, both of those are so significant to me too. And just uh, the worship, worship, worship of you are my all in all. And then the dancing. I just danced and danced and danced. Uh, I belong to Jesus. I remember that. And this is you wrote those how many years ago? Uh, oh, over 30 years ago. Over 30 years ago. And yeah, that was, you know, when I was first first saved and first heard about your music ministry and testimony and those those really touched me uh, in the churches that i was attending and then i got to meet you personally and then uh, I, i'm really glad to call you a friend now and i just uh, i i've just been touched i i think the most important thing uh, with my memory of you is what you're talking about right now that uh, just the healing that you've experienced and the joy that that brings and even in the midst of painful awful suicidal gunk you had you have found a new way in jesus and everything you have flows out of that and that has flowed out to me that the three memories that come to my mind of of my interactions not not necessarily with you but uh, i was at a, a church service at shady grove church back you know i think oh, it's wow. gateway now but it was years ago years ago and I had gone down, took a friend for Promise Keepers. I drove down from Illinois to Dallas to try to get him there because he really needed Jesus. And, and cool. he, did, he accepted Jesus at the con at the event. And then, then the next day, a friend uh, invited me over to Shady Grove. And so I went. And I just remember kneeling on the steps leading up to the stage as you were playing the piano and singing. And uh, I just bawled. I just bawled. I just, my shoulders heaving, the bawling, bawling just because i was exhausted emotionally i was spent just tr seeing what god was doing in this friend's life and everything was like just poured out and laid at the altar and i stood up with such joy and such healing and it uh, i had been pouring out to this friend and then you poured it to me and filled me back up again to go out and keep doing it and it just made me cry you know that that was what a second one was after Lana died and I went to my wife, Lana, and she passed away 10 years ago. And I, I came to a retreat at your house uh, for a weekend. And I think it was the first one you did maybe as in that mode of, of a retreat and or a second or something. And I, and I just asked you if I could just lay down under your piano and as you played and worshiped and I grabbed some pillows from the couch and I just laid on the floor face down on the piano, and then on my side, then on my back, just looking up and just receiving, receiving, receiving. And it gave me such a, such a joy to go on, you know, after this ma major loss in my life. Um, and the third one I remember that was about the joy. I remember being at a concert of yours that could, could have been in Dallas, but it, it was, it was a big, big venue, a huge stadium. And, uh, I was up near the top with my with my wife, and you made a comment about uh, don't judge those people who are jumping up and singing, jumping up and down and singing and and dancing all around. He said, because you have no idea what they might have been set free from. That's right. I just thought 
isn't that the freedom we all need? Because man, I I feel so constrained sometimes, so constricted sometimes. But the words that you've spoken have really freed me to say, hey, I have been freed from so much. And if I want to raise my hands, if I want to shout, if I want to dance, if I scream sometimes and just fall on my face, that is okay. Uh, and you've given me permission to do all those things and healing. So I just wanted to share those with you and with the people that are watching. Well, that makes me want to keep going. That that fills me up more than you know, just hearing stories like that, because I have people in my life who did that very same thing for me. Hmm. In fact, I was sharing that Wednesday night with our home church group. Hmm. We started a church in our home many years ago. We call it all in all church and we meet every Wednesday evening and we just invite hurting people to come and you're not the first and mm. you won't be the last to, to mm. lay on the piano. <laughs> Believe it or not, people ask to do that all the time. <laughs> uh. I do believe it. I, I didn't know that was a thing, but I, I do believe it because yeah, it's that's happening. where I wanted to be. That's what I, I just, the soundboard and the, I just, just wanted to be underneath there and just let it flow. Yeah. That's the way I used to be with the music of second chapter of Acts and Keith mm -hmm. Green mm -hmm. and God used their music to push me into an awareness that I was at rock bottom in depravity mm -hmm. and I felt utterly hopeless and wanted to end my life. Mm. And God used the music of Annie Herring to keep me from taking my life. Mm. In fact, set me free at one of their concerts, Second Chapter of Acts concerts. And I couldn't stop lifting my hands. And then I <laughs> I felt a little ashamed at first, like, because why can't I lift my hands? Jesus lifted his hands for me. Mm. Big deal. <laughs> and then I would think about things like, I go to a basketball game or a football game and my team scores a touchdown. The first thing I do is lift my hands and shout and jump up and down. And I'm like, that's not even eternal. Hmm. And so how could I not express with everything that I am, what, what God has done for me? God's word says, let the redeemed of the Lord uh, sit quietly on their hands and people will know they're born again or redeemed. <laughs> It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If we have been redeemed, Amen. don't say what we've been redeemed from. How in the world are those in the same bondage going to even know freedom is possible? So, Amen. Amen. And you and I have been set free from something that people don't even think you can or should be set free from. And uh, <laughs> unhealthy attractions and things that can really take us down. And I just... I just think there is freedom for anyone in any situation. You're not stuck in anything. You're not stuck. Jesus is the big unsticker. He can, he can, right. he can break I, you out of anything. What I like to say is if you're breathing, there is hope. Mm, amen. Amen. <laughs> and to hear it from you at this stage of your life too, that's really important because you've yeah. had this diagnosis and you've, you know, for some people, you've said that they think that's a death sentence. And for you, you've said, this is the way life is. This is, and I'm going to keep going through this just like I've done everything else. When I made the first public announcement of my diagnosis, I had droves of people giving me cures and all kinds of stuff. And I was at a huge church somewhere in another state. I won't say where it is, but someone came up to me afterwards, a couple and they said to me, we just experienced this with our parents. And what you're about to go through is absolutely horrible. Uh, and I, I was, uh, what do you say in that moment? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for caring so much to scare uh, the crap out of me. But then it was in that moment that I decided, no, nobody gets to dictate to me how I feel. Mm. Every I have is every feeling I have is attached to a thought I think so mm. put off stinking thinking and put on right thinking even mm. about Parkinson's and until God heals me one way or the other I'm going to keep my eyes fixed on him and my my personal rule is Dennis Jernigan does not get to call himself something other than what his father God calls him so that protects my mind it guards my mind and my heart 
as much as anything these days. Mm. Mm. My father defines me, not Parkinson's, not another person, uh, nobody. Not your unhealthy attractions, nothing. No, no. God no. defines you. God defines you. And let's just jump in here because you've shared some of these things in your book and I've got it here on my iPad. It's <laughs> I love the title, Parkinson's and Recreation. <laughs> Very clever. I think you ended up with a good, a good one there. But you share some you share several of these things in the book. And each time I read it, I was like, wow, those are words of life for me and for a lot of people. And so I, I encourage people to grab a copy on Amazon, just look for Dennis Jernigan, look for Parkinson's and Recreation, and get your Kindle yeah. paperback or whatever way you can. And he's got an album that goes with it too that he'll send you for free or you can listen to on any streaming service. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I do love your book. I just think it's uh, it's real, it's honest, it's your story, and it's uh, you know, it's it's classic Dennis Jernigan. It's funny. It's oh my god, uh, I, I even hate to say the line that made me burst out laughing the first time. But yeah, you were you were getting some kind of deep massage therapy, and it was, <laughs> it was so painful with some kind of tool that was like mm, digging into you, and you said, "Hang on, that last." a battle axe yeah and now, and and you said now i know what the opposite of an erection feels like. <laughs> uh, that is i knew every, every guy would understand that level of pain that is dj that is dj that is that is classic you 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 take a, a super painful moment you make it funny and you you, you turn it into a joyful moment you turn it in you say i'm not going to let this define me i'm not going to let this pain uh, take me yeah. under and it's not easy it's not easy and i'm not saying it's easy to do what you're doing but it is possible and there is hope and uh i, I love that as you just told story after story that i thought were really uh classic well, laughter <laughs> does good like a medicine it really does sometimes that's all you can do is just laugh and you mentioned well, maybe it was in your review you wrote for my book. You mentioned uh, something about my hand. I, mm. If you were just observing me, you would see there was a slight tremor in my right hand. And that's the basic, most apparent outward affect affectation of the disease for me at this point anyway. Um, but we were praying as a family around the dinner table one evening and one of my sons was holding my hand. Well, I get even more anxious because I don't want people to be distracted by the hand tremor. And But it shakes even more violently and goes mm. basically out of control mm. when I get anxious. And you should see me watching an action adventure thriller movie. My mm. hand just goes nuts and I'm worn out by the end of the movie or whatever, but uh, I'm, I say all that to say this, my son, when we were through with the prayer, he said, dad, there is a party going on in your hand. That's your party hand. So that's what we call my hand now. My tremoring hand is that's grandpa's or dad's party hand. And uh, uh, just another illustration of what I mean by that is uh, this past year, my daughter and husband, her husband, and two of our granddaughters live in Australia, and we hadn't gotten to see them in person for uh, about five years. And my fear was that uh, they were going to be afraid of me, my granddaughters, even though we had developed a relationship on FaceTime talking each week. It's not the same as being with the, someone in person and experiencing the symptoms and the effects of the disease. And so I was my fear was that they were going to reject me or be afraid of me, but they ran up to me in their little Aussie accents and said, gee, pa, gee, pa. And they just hugged me and held me and they fought over holding my hands. And then this fear just welled over me. Mm -hmm. Oh no, they're going to find out. They're going to be afraid of me. So the five-year-old, her name's Matilda, took my party hand, my right hand, and Elliot, the seven-year-old, took my left hand and they wanted to walk to bag baggage claim with, with g as they call me. And of course my hand starts tremoring like crazy. And 
my granddaughter said, Jeepa, what's, what's wrong with your hand? It's shaking. And my wife didn't miss a beat. She said, that's grandpa's party hand. Whenever you hold that hand and it begins to shake, the more it shakes, the more he's glad to be with you. Mm. And that's all she needed to hear. So for the next three weeks of their visit, when it came time to walk through this magical forest I've created for my grandkids, um, they would fight over who got to hold grandpa's party hand. <laughs> so what a turnaround and what a blessing for you with all that fear because you don't, you can't control it. So no. you made the best of it. And Melinda, thanks for her stepping in. Ezra, your son, I think dubbed it party hand. And <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love that. You, you, you can look at it two different ways and your yeah, God's point of view is always the better point of view. I see a mountain, I, especially when I was first diagnosed, I, I, would, I just felt this was an insurmountable mountain, no coming back from. And he told me right away, you have, I've given you Heinz feet for high places. You can, you can get over this mountain. Mm. But here's what I want you to see, son. From your point of view, it, it's a mountain. From my point of view, it's nothing but a, a mere molehill. Mm what I want you to see. Mm. That's why I've, I've been able to walk. Not, I mean this, I'm not just saying this to sell a book or anything. I feel joyful. I don't feel depressed. Mm. I may look depressed because one of the effects, uh, one of the symptoms of Parkinson's is what's called masking. It has a scientific name, but if you saw my driver's license, which I took right after I was diagnosed, I took the picture for a new driver's license and I look like a zombie. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I have to be extra aware when we're taking family pictures, I think I'm smiling and I look at the pictures and I'm not smiling at all. So mm -hmm. those kinds of things I have to really work to make happen uh, in a physical sense. Uh, I was talking with a doctor friend not long after I received the diagnosis, and he said, Jernigan, describe to me your symptoms. So I went down all the list of symptoms that uh, the neurologist had told me uh, I had. And this doctor friend looked at me and he said, Jernigan, you don't have Parkinson's. You're just getting old. <laughs> and I said, that, that statement right there, does more for me mm. than thing the medical profession has told me. Mm. It's, that's just part of life is, is growing older. Mm. And I, I've met lots of people with Parkinson's who have foggy brains. <laughs> mm. Mm. So anyway, whatever uh, that was. I'm really glad to hear that all. It really does help. And, it, and it, I think it's helpful to let people know uh, for your sake, but also for other people who struggle with this disease or other diseases. I think of my great grandparents' picture that I have hanging on my wall, and they're all deadpan expressions. And I thought, wow, they're so sad. It's black and white and so sad. But then I was told because of the long exposure, it would take like 15 minutes. Right. They told them, instructed them not to smile because they'd have to hold that same smile the whole time. And it's like, oh, wow, these aren't sad, depressed farmers from Illinois. They're they're probably really joyful, thrilled to be taking a family photo in their best clothes, you know, and it just changes my perspective when I see them. So it's the same, I think, with you and with others and uh, anyone really, I think, uh, I think we, we don't know what's going on on the inside. Same with someone jumping up and down and joyful and we judge them and saying, what well, is their problem? Why are they such a fanatic? And it's like, well, <laughs> if you knew what was going on inside them, you'd know, you know, and Give me a fanatic any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I want to play a little clip of your song, if that's okay, too. Two of your songs from your from your album. I love that too. And one one thing that really struck me when I when I turned it on first, I, I listened, uh, and I'm I'm listening on Spotify. I'm just going to share if it if it shares here. If I post this on YouTube, you get royalties for this too, so it doesn't come to me. It'll go to you. So I'm, I'm not violating nice. anything. You'll get it. Uh, because I love your music. Let me just share my screen and share my sound. And I, I loved the opening of the album. And you've just released this. The title might as well be happy. I love this song. Share your song. And I'm going to do just a clip from 
might as well be happy. What I loved was you started the album really happy. There's a big, big God with a big, big love. Enough for one and all. He can take a mountain in your way so tall. Show you how he sees it and make it very small. I'm just going to pause there, but that's exactly what you just said about taking that mountain and making it very small. And you did it with a beautiful uh, lilt and a fun keyboard thing going on. And you, it's you whistling, right? That's me whistling. Yeah. And I just loved the opening of the, of the album with this song. And I just want to dance also because it just, I was sort of, I was a little nervous. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to hear Dennis's most deep, dark, uh, healing songs, but they're going to take me in this deep, dark place. And you started off with this joyful <laughs> dance music, and then you're whistling and talking about turning your mountains. I'll play just a little more clip, but I love the way you open the album. It, it really put me at ease, and it made me say, okay, I'm, I want to listen to everything you have. And you did get into the deep and wonderful, you know, traditional, for me, Dennis Dernigan, sure. what really touched me. But here's the... Might as well be happy I might as well rejoice I might as well be happy If I'm given a choice I might... It's great. I love it. And the other clip I wanted to play was from Eternally Mortal Invisible God. And you do something with your voice here that I just loved. And uh, I know you've uh, been frustrated that your voice has not always cooperated with you in the in the in recent years, you mentioned this in your book, but uh, this is just brilliant. This is about 25 seconds into this song. Eternal, immortal, invisible God, my Redeemer, my Savior, forever I stand in awe. Wow. <laughs> what you did with your voice right there when you said, ah, I'm like, you had that breathiness before it and soft and quiet. And then you just built it and built it and built it and built it. And I'm just like, man, I just felt like I was under your piano. I felt like I was at your concert. I felt like I was at Shady Grove on my knees. It just said, <laughs> you've still got it. <laughs> you've still got it. And that's not, that's not to say I was worried about it, uh, just that you shared in your book about it. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I know it means so much to you, but uh, your voice and everything. And I know you're going to be fine. Whatever happens, your voice, your hands, your piano, your life, your ministry, you're going to face it well. But man, I'll just tell you that moved me. Moved me. Well, that just moved me hearing you play it. It just does something to me to know other people are listening to the music and uh, that God's not done with me yet here on this earth. Absolutely. Uh, and I have some friends that have Parkinson's that I'm going to share this and share this podcast with them right away. And I, I was so glad reading the book because I, I didn't understand what they were going through and you do. And you have the words to speak life to them, and uh, you know whatever you're whatever you're facing, any kind of mountain, anything that you know you feel like you can't shake it off. I said to my Amazon <laughs> review, let Dennis take you by his party hand and lift you up because he, he can do it. And I'm I just think it's going to bring great healing for many more people as it gets out and people get the word out and. Uh, I don't say that because I'm trying to promote your books and your music and your stuff for any reason except it's healing and it touches people and it it helps them and then it blesses you back too uh, when people do uh, grab a copy and listen to your streams and uh, all those I appreciate things. that more than you know I I get about 20 between 25 and 30,000 listens on Spotify alone each month oh that's just one of the streaming services so that's one God has been faithful to keep providing even though most of those songs are 15 or 20 or even 30 or 
35 years old by this point. Mm -hmm. Writing for over 40 years. And anyway, with yeah. that and YouTube yeah. and all the other social media outlets, I get about 300,000 listens a year. Mm. Amazing. Because when I was starting out, Christian radio wouldn't play live worship music at all. And mm. so I didn't mm. have the benefit of uh, having radio airplay or anything like that, except on mom and pop stations, independent stations. Mm. Mm. Two independent stations that I want to just give a shout out to are the Gate Radio Network and Graceway Radio, because they both continue to just flood my music mm. out there and have promoted the heck out of this book. Mm. And I didn't even have to ask them. They just did that. Mm. So God has done things in spite of the way the Christian music business tends to operate. And I don't even know what I'm trying to say there. I, I blame that on the Parkinson's. So. <laughs> no, actually, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's wonderful. And I'm glad that people are able to still be exposed to you in these ways, even without the backing of a big record label or whatever and you have had that backing your songs have been published widely but you're also able to release things on your own and you you put out such a well thousands of songs tens of thousands of songs you've written and received and and then your books you know dozens of books i don't know how many books you're up to now but you've you, you've got a wealth of material and if people want to find out more you go to dennisternigan.com um, and you, if you want to support Dennis and what he's doing too, I'll encourage that strongly, uh, you know, and just, just bless him as he's been a blessing to you and bless him as he continues to bless others. He's got a Patreon and you can follow him on there and, and support him there too. So, uh, I, I just say bless you, Dennis, and I, I'm not wrapping up the interview, but since, since we're talking about this, I want to just say bless you, bless you, bless you. And I hope others will continue to bless you. I'm glad, I'm glad it's just continuing to go bigger and bigger. That's great. Doing that, that means so much to me. I also love your movie, your own story of your life, "Sing Over Me," and you can watch that on Amazon. You can watch oh. it on, yeah. You can down, you can get the book uh, "Sing Over Me," but it's it's a beautiful testimony of, uh, very similar in some ways to what I went through with unhealthy attractions, and they were just taking me down. And then Jesus showed up in a way, and in both our lives, we didn't know each other at that time, but in in both our lives, in at different places, and uh, just turned us around, turned us around 180 degrees. Uh, I got married, have six kids. You got married, have nine kids. And then the grands are, I don't remember how many you're up to now. I think 13. 13 grands. And, mm -hmm. yeah, but you were headed towards suicide and you were headed towards, you know, the possible death yourself just from the behaviors that you were involved in. And, and I was in the same situation. And, uh, so if we seem joyful or tearful and, and hopeful, it's because God's given us hope in our darkest, darkest hours. But Sing Over Me is is the movie documentary of his life. And I loved watching the premiere of that with you uh, uh, down in uh, Oklahoma. And then also, uh, you know, you, you can watch it on streaming or get the book. And I loved reading the book. It, had some, it actually spurred me to write my story, too, because... Uh, there were many people at that time that were starting to doubt whether this was even possible and people like you and me and uh, hundreds of others, you know, of course, and thousands, but uh, we, I just felt we need to tell our story because there's, you know, there, there's more people need to tell their story. And so I wrote my book, 50 Shades of Grace under a pen name, uh, and, was dear. and I, you know, I just, I just told my story brutally honest and it's touched a lot of people too and so you've encouraged me in that and i'd encourage people that are watching to consider writing your story you know consider writing your story because your story you know everyone has a million dollar book inside them you just have to tell your own story but be brutally honest that's the part yeah. that's hard but uh dennis has definitely done that and i've uh, done that now and uh, and, and it's worth a lot to people. It doesn't necessarily generate a million for me, but it does. It is a story that's helped have, give people hope, uh, yeah. which is more than a million dollars. You know, I, I called you Dennis, and something in your book that struck me that I did not, I did not know about you. you know, there were a lot of things I didn't know about your, you know, just your personal life, your difference between you and Melinda. Uh, <laughs> you know, I see, I see both the public side. I've seen a little bit of the private side, but I've. Uh, 
something that really made me curious was uh, you've asked me to call you DJ before, <laughs> uh, but I just have always known you as Dennis Jernigan. And so I just call you Dennis and I call you, but yeah. I always feel awkward because you say, Eric, call me DJ, call me DJ. And I'm like, oh, that sounds too intimate, too familiar. It's it's like a nickname that I don't, you know, I don't, I don't feel I have the, the right to say, or, you know, I don't have the life experience with you, something like that. But I also don't like nicknames. And I thought of Melinda because I, nickname whenever i was called a nickname it was bad it was negative mm -hmm. growing mm -hmm. up it was hurtful and i said use my real name i was just and i made it a, a point to use people's real name and it became sort of a you know a, a problem when someone says hey call me dj i'm like no i'm going to call you your you know dennis journey and that's what everybody else knows i'm going to call you dennis and i'm not comfortable using a nickname but it wasn't till i read your book that i realized i was like melinda in she had received some hurtful things. She didn't like teasing. She didn't like people jumping out of closets and scaring her. She didn't like, <laughs> she didn't like her children plotting death, death, <laughs> death. And it was like, and you love that. You love that. And even when I was swimming in your pool, we were at that weekend retreat and the, you know, a number of us were out and we were playing a game of tag and you were going to be, you were the, you were the tagger and you, I mean, you treated it like a battle. I mean, you were going to win this war and well, the rest of us were like, poor little fish in the pond we didn't you know we didn't know what happened you just tag 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 and everybody was out and i was like was that fun did he enjoy that? <laughs> because for me i i never liked that aggressive i'm gonna beat you i didn't like trash talk because i just didn't because of trash talk because of right. because of bullying and so i was always like hey let's all get along let's all play together but reading your book i got a new perspective that you know those nicknames that you have the party hand that you call it the uh, talking about you know erection in a negative way <laughs> whatever uh, you know and having your son you know plotting your murder and, and, and you guys going back and forth to to try to outdo each other and trash talk each other and i'm like and you were saying how that endearing that is to you and when your your kids and grandkids do that for you melinda not so much but she's yeah. got to, to understand it. Anyway, it was an insight that really helped me. And, you know, I'm going to say, I can call you DJ. It's okay. <laughs> That's my problem, not yours. But well, my I, mom has the same problem. She says, I don't like it when people call you DJ. Interesting. I named you Dennis. And I said, it's oh. okay. Mom. Most of my guy friends call me DJ. All right. I want to be your guy friend, DJ. That's great. I'll, I'll fit in that category just fine. I do want to talk about what people do with unhealthy attractions because we all have them. We all have yeah. people in our lives, people we run up against that we're like, oh, we have to interact with them or we, we, we want to take a second look or we want to dwell on it or we want to let's linger a little longer <laughs> or we fantasize about it. Uh, people in our lives, whether they're you know, n not our spouse, not our thing, same sex, opposite sex, young old the range of things people uh you have dealt with this your whole life you have ministered to people your whole life i'm looking for the top 100 tips <laughs> of what to tell people how to deal with them because we all have them and I, i'm thinking of writing a book even about this so you're you're my first uh, fodder for the book uh all right you know what what are some simple tips and if you don't want to go there that's fine but this is this is sort of my question too because even at, i'm 59 and gonna be 60 uh, next month i think you're about five years ahead of me but i'm uh, 64 64 okay so yeah five years ahead of me and i i still get this question and i still deal with this I still deal with this and the power of it's broken over me. I've not uh, acted out on uh, anything outside of marriage for 36 years, including the 10 years I've not been married sure. since I lost my wife. And I just got a 36 year coin from my recovery group saying, you know, awesome. that doesn't mean I don't still have these feelings and these thoughts. And especially when I'm down or tired or whatever, exhausted. And then you say, Oh, I just want a place of comfort and, it could take all kinds of shapes and forms, but I know they're yeah. unhealthy. So anything strike you in the, at the top of that First list? First thing that comes to my mind is I set myself up for success, not for failure. Mm. And so I surround myself with people who are not going to be yes men or yes women. Mm. They're going to tell me the truth. Melinda is the main truth speaker in my life. Mm. 
when I'm going to go be with anyone, she knows exactly who I'm going to be with, where I'm going to be, what we're going to be doing. Mm. It's a safety net. It's not that she's the guardian of my mind, but she is in a sense, part of the team, the biggest part of the team aside from the Lord. So I set myself up to succeed and I don't put myself in positions to be confronted even with the temptation. Temptation doesn't define anyone. So that helps me as much as anything, realizing Jesus was tempted in every manner, just as we are yet without sin. Mm. So temptation is an, a clue from the Holy Spirit saying, basically, why is the enemy after you in this area? God must have something for you. So and rather than turning to the temptation, I turn to Father and say, Father, what is it? What is it you're trying to say to me? And it protects my heart and my mind. My mind is the battleground. So I, especially with Parkinson's, Parkinson's, I'm very aware of that. In fact, mm. one of the first things that Melinda and I talked about was the possibility of, uh, in the later stages, it's a possibility for dementia or Alzheimer's or any number of things. And I said to her, I don't want to go back to my old way of thinking. Mm. So we're constantly renewing our minds. I'm constantly renewing my mind whenever I, and we call it stinking thinking. I learned that from Jack Taylor. Mm. Whenever I think a thought that is uh, opposed to the word of God, I recognize it for what it is. It's a lie from the pit of hell. I put it under my feet, kick it to the curb, put on the truth and go on down the road. Mm. I don't let the enemy accuse me, uh, I turn it back on him. I mm. don't talk to him other than to say, get behind me, say, Satan. Mm. Uh, I'm at the end of the book, I win. So there you go. And one of the th things my family has done for me, they've made uh, what we call a truth jar. In fact, they've made two for me through the years. Mm. Uh, one, when I was after I'd just undergone knee replacement surgery about 10 years ago, uh, the anesthesia call caused me to have panic attacks. I'd never had a panic attack in my life. I didn't even know what was happening. Mm. And in those moments in the hospital, when I was just freaking out after coming out from under the anesthesia, I would say to Melinda, speak something true to me so I can hold on to something foundational. Mm. I need to hold on to, and she would begin going down the list. You have a God that loves you. You have a God that found you and went after you and rescued you. You have a wife that loves you faithfully. You have nine children who would lay down their lives for you. You have all these grandchildren. You have all these people around the world who sing. And after a while, after she spoke truth into my mind, the lie, lies were always put down. And we recognized fear was a big part of that. And when I ever I'm faced with fear, like the possibility of even losing my mind at some point, uh, that's quelled by putting on the love of God, receiving the love of God, reveling in the love of God, just basking in the love of God, realizing not only does he love me, but he likes me and he likes being with me. And I learned that from being a dad. I love it now that my children are adults and we can talk about anything and they'll come over like when our daughter came over from Australia and all the kids got together, were able to get together, except the one who was trapped in Canada because of COVID restrictions there. Mm -hmm. He's married and lives in Canada. He couldn't come. So, but we still had most of the family together and we were sitting in our music room, our worship room, our living room. We call it by any of those three names. And Melinda and I just sat there, not even talking, but just listening. Mm. And I found such joy and ecstasy and just uh, mm. like this flood of sheer love in mm. the room. Mm. I thought, me as an earthly father, if I feel that way about just being with my children, mm. how much more does my heavenly father love just being with me? Mm. 
So those kinds of things help me keep my mind focused on what's right and what's good and what's honorable and what's true and what's pure and what's holy. Hmm. Those kinds of things I'm going to think on when they're teaching government agents to recognize counterfeit money. They don't show them counterfeit money. They show them the real thing so that when the counterfeit comes along, they'll recognize it instantly because it's not like what the real thing is. And the real thing I'm referring to is the word of God. Mm-hmm. I fill my mind with the word of God verses like Micah seven, eight, do not rejoice over me, me, my enemy, though I fall, I will rise. Though I walk in the darkness, the Lord is a light for me. In other words, when I'm tempted, I'll reach for my truth jar or a piece of God's word and, and the truth jar. I'll get back to that. My kids all wrote out verses of scripture for me or jokes that brought joy or a, a memory of some kind that spoke truth to my mind. And anytime I feel attacked by the enemy, I go to the truth jar and I've got, like I said, I've got two of them now because when mm. I got part they made me another one mm. and I pull out a slip and it's always the, just like the perfect thing I needed to hear mm. put that on in place of whatever fear or whatever lie was being told mm. Mm. so I don't know if I'm answering your question or not but you've answered it in so many ways and I set myself up to succeed not yeah. to fail I love and that. here's the deal if I'm if, if I'm running a race and I fall, I don't have to go back to the starting line and start over. Mm. I get up where I fell and I run towards the finish line. And that's mm-hmm. Jesus. Mm. He is so quick to forgive, but we're so, we allow shame to dictate to us sometimes yeah. that we can't forgive ourselves. And that's us saying we're more, more holy than God. God's mm. forgotten about our sin as far as the East is from the West. We should too. I love that, that you don't have to go back to the starting line again. You just get up and keep running from there. Because yeah. I mentioned that I had this 36-year coin, and I, I was afraid to even go get it. I'd never gotten a coin like that or anything. And I thought, and they were, this group was offering it. And I said, I've never actually celebrated this. Maybe I should, but I don't want to get it and then stumble the next day. You know, and it's like, I've, I've had <laughs> this record, but, you know, none of us have a perfect record. None of, you know, and no. that's not the goal, you know, the goal. But there are times we need to celebrate those victories. But sure. I love what you just said about, you know, hey, you stumble along the way. You keep going. You keep running the race. Keep running towards Jesus. That's the goal. Not how perfect can I be in this life because none of us are going to get there. Yeah. I asked, I said, when do I get the perfect coin? When do I get the when do I get the, the chip that says you're done? And I don't want to think about that because I don't think I get it till heaven. But I was actually in Italy this last, uh, last week for Easter and I got a an Italian, not an Italian year at Lyra, but it's the Italian version of the Euro and it's got the Vitruvian man on it, Da Vinci's drawing of the yeah. man and the perfect dimensions and all. And a lot of people think it's the ideal man. And as I looked at that and I got this coin, I was like, that is the coin and that is Jesus. Not that that's Jesus, not that that's what he meant at all. But for yeah. me, that's the coin that represents when, when God looks at me, he sees Jesus and I am clothed in this Jesus suit that God looks at me and he doesn't see me as perfect or imperfect. He, he sees Jesus and he sees everything that Jesus was. And I said, wow, I can have that coin right now. I don't have to wait till I die. In God's eyes, I am perfect. And just like you say, we need to have those identity and that truth. And I don't need to be walking around like, oh, God, I've got to tough it out until I'm, you know, X number of years old. And then I die. And then finally, did I make it? Did I make it? We can know right now, right That's now, right. you can sit up straight and say, in God's eyes, I am perfect. I am the way he created me to be. And if I fall, if I, you know, you don't, you don't chastise your child if they fall off the bike when you're teaching them how to ride. You, you brush them off, you put them back on the bike, you give them a push. And that's what God does our whole lives. And we keep falling off, but we're trying not to. We don't want to get scraped up. He says, don't do this or you're going to, you know, don't go down that street. That's not going to, you're going to fall off. Stay on this street. Anyway, I just love that little coin thing that I got last week. I was like, I got it. I got it. And I got it. I love it. 1987, when I put my faith in Jesus, honestly, I said, wow, there is nothing perfect in me, but 
you are perfect. And for anybody watching, I know you'd say the same to them. You know, you'd encourage them to put their faith in Christ for everything in their life. Yeah. And think about this. You mentioned falling off a bike and scraping your knee. Uh, people think that they have to be perfect to come into the Lord's presence. And the reality, the simple reality is we never leave God's presence. Mm. We either forget he's there or we choose to ignore him. The mm. reality is that when my kids were small uh, and they would fall and scrape their knee or fall into a puddle and get all covered with mud, I never waited until they bound up their own wounds or wiped away their own grime and dirt and mud. Mm. I picked them up right where they were and held them close. Mm. And I did the, the binding of the wounds. I did the cleansing of the wounds. Mm. I'm an earthly father again. So how much more does our heavenly father want to be that for us, to mm. be that healer, that binder up of our wounds, the one who sings us those songs that calm and soothe our souls. Mm. So you need to get over that lie that you mm. can't come to the Lord's presence until you're all confessed up. None of us would ever get there if we Amen. waited. That. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I want to wind down our time here. I could talk to you for hours and days, but at least for the recording sake, I'm going to, I'm going to wind this down, but I want to share two intimate moment uh, things with you. And then I'd love to hear anything else from you and pray uh, at the end or anything else that's on your heart. Um, but one in relation to God, just loving us, what you're talking about there and just loving us as we are and helping us even in our woundedness. And I was praying with a man, uh, on Zoom, he's a spiritual director for me, and uh, he he was just guiding me through some prayer time and just saying, you know, where is Jesus, and where where is he right now, and what where do you see yourself in relation to him? And immediately, I'm sitting here at the same desk I am, but immediately I pictured myself laying on the bed, just looking, you know, looking up at the ceiling, just laying there, and on my left. I told him this is really awkward to share after after the experience, but I said on my left was Jesus laying next to me, like up on his up on his on his uh, elbow, and just looking at me and just looking at me with this pleased look on his face, like I would look at Lana when she was sleeping, and she would often sleep uh, with with nothing on or with you know various things, and I and I just look at her and I would just look at her and I just go wow, I can't believe I get to be with her. I can't believe she's, you know, this gift from God to me. She, I, I just, I would just look at her and just try to take her all in. And I felt like Jesus was doing that with me in that prayer moment that he was just looking at me. Didn't matter if I was clothed or naked. He sees it all. He sees it all. And he was pleased. And because of my previous struggles with unhealthy issues and you know the, the various you know struggles with men and women and attractions that I had, there has been a distance still with me and Jesus that I've I've not recognized because I'm like well there is a boundary I need to have and people talk about you want to be embrace Jesus and let him come into you and let him be with you and let have that intimate moment and I'm like it's a little awkward it's a little uncomfortable honestly you know to to be that close. But in that moment, I felt that close. I felt like, and it was good because he had made me and he loves me. And it wasn't bizarre or unusual. It was like, this is the way it ought to be, that that intimacy. And as I shared that with this man who was praying for me afterward, he said, "So that is so healthy to hear. And I think so many men need to hear that, mm. <laughs> that there can be that kind of intimacy with Jesus. And I don't think that's a problem, Eric. I think that's a solution. And it just freed me up to say, wow, there is a deeper level I can go here with Jesus that I've been like calling you DJ. I've sort of held back from calling you that because I don't, I don't know if I have that ability to do that, but uh, <laughs> that's my problem, not yours. You've asked me to, and you, you know, You've said your guy friends call you this. So it's the same with Jesus. He's invited me to full intimacy with him, to live in me, to dwell with me, to anyway, be my hands, my feet, my head, my heart, my ears, my eyes. And one I, of the best descriptions I ever heard of intimacy, and I wish this was original to me because it's so awesome. 
But true intimacy is me saying to my father, God, father, here's my heart into me, see. Mm. But it's not true intimacy until we realize that in that same moment, he's saying, well, son, here's my heart into me, see. Mm. And there's nothing hidden. The utter reality is God sees the things we think he doesn't see, and he loves us right where we are. But the good news, he loves us enough to not leave us there. Mm. We don't hide anything. We think we do, but we don't. Mm. 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 <laughs> but he loves us anyway. Mm. I love that. I love all that. The second intimate thing that I want to share was actually when I was at your house for that retreat and uh, I had lost Lana and when I when I saw you that weekend I knew that you knew what that meant in regard to my own healing because you'd walk the same path and to receive the joy of a wife for life <laughs> and all the healing that that brought and then to lose that and all that that signified. And when I walked in, you gave me the biggest hug and you held on, you didn't let go. You didn't say anything. And it was just cheek to cheek. And I could feel the bristles of your beard on my face. And you didn't let me go. And I knew that you knew. <laughs> and I've not shared that story with others because of my issues. <laughs> but I can tell you that spoke more to me than most anything anyone else ever said. Because you got me. You understood, and I knew that you understood, and I was able to walk away again with a much more freedom and healing just by being in your presence and being that close to you. So I just want to share with others that that's possible, and you can have that with God too, that kind of intimacy with your father with Jesus, your best friend, the lover of your soul. And I just want to say thank you, Dennis. Thank you, DJ, for being my friend. I'm there. As long as I have breath, I'm here, buddy. Thanks. All right. I would love... Uh, to have a little bit of prayer time too as we close. Let me grab a Kleenex and then let's pray. I've already got mine. <laughs> well, I'm going to say just a, just a word of prayer for you. And then if you would be willing to pray for me and pray for those that are watching, whatever's on your heart to pray for them uh, as well. And I know it'll bring, bring some healing to them and, and joy and freedom to whatever they're facing. So uh, that would be a wonderful way to close. Father, thank you for this time with DJ. Thank you for this time with my friend. and Thank you that he calls me friend too. And Lord, we just love you and thank you for bringing us through these struggles. Uh, even though we're states apart, uh, we've been able to communicate and encourage each other over the years. And I just thank you for that, Lord. I pray for a, a continued healing for him physically, mentally, emotionally. Lord, I just pray in every way you would continue to bring that healing. God, we know you could do it just in a moment. Maybe there's just in a moment like that, Lord, you could just do it. And God, we ask for that. That's our desire. We want to, we want to, we want that, Lord. We want that, Lord. God, we also just want everything of you. And we thank you that you're there with us as we walk through every single thing we go through. Old age, Parkinson's, loss, grief, chaos, attractions, temptations. God, thank you for being there with us every step of the way. God, thank you, Lord, that we don't have to walk this journey alone. And 
God, even if even if our situation doesn't change, Lord, you can give us a new perspective and we don't have to do it alone. And that's worth everything. But we also have the hope that you could change anything in a moment or over time, Lord, and you'll give us the tools to do it. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, I lift up Eric to you and I want to say thank you for 36 years of victory and that's just a drop in the bucket of eternity mm. that we get to spend with you in victory. You've sealed our victory. You found us, you pursued us. And I thank you for pursuing Eric and for pursuing me. And thank you for the grace that is getting him through the loss of his precious beloved Lana. And I ask you, Lord, to continue to do that. And I can't even imagine life without Melinda, Father. Mm. So I know, I just know it would hurt so profoundly. So thank you for being there for my brother and continue to make him aware of your ever present presence with him. When he sleeps, give to him in his sleep. When he is going about his days, let him have visions of your presence with him. Father, for the, all those who are watching, who are struggling with their identity, regardless of whether it be sexual or otherwise, I ask you for grace for them to understand that you are you love them right where they are, but you love them enough to not leave them there and that you took it all on the cross. You bore the weight of every sin, every depraved thought, every act against your word. You took it and bore it all on the cross for us and paid the debt ultimately and conclusively and fully and helped them to place their faith in you and let go of the lies of the enemy and receive the truth of who you are. And then through the years, as they walk with you, help them to rip away the grave clothes that they thought defined them and reveal the heart of truth and grace that you planted in them, their true identity in Christ. And Lord, let us just be bathed in your love and teach us how to do that more every day in true intimacy and what that looks like in this life and the next. And Lord, I ask you just to give us all a sense of life being a grand adventure, a journey that's meant to be enjoyed, not just coped with or endured, but Lord, flat out enjoyed. And I thank you that you've given me joy even in the midst of Parkinson's. I thank you that you've given Eric joy even in the midst of losing his precious wife. We'll see each other again soon lord mm. we will so give us visions of what that's going to look like our hope is in jesus so let us keep our eyes on jesus every step of the way and when we fall lord just we will reach for your hand that we know is reaching for us and help us back up and run with all our might as if our life Depended on it towards the finish line. Hmm. The finish line looks just like Jesus. So give us the grace to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love that. God can reach out his party hand to us anytime. And That's good. Shake us up and bring us in and give us joy. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing your party hand with me and reaching out and uh, oh. just being a friend too. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I love it. Yeah. And just a quick repeat, you can go to DennisJernigan.com. His new book is Parkinson's and Recreation. His new album is Might As Well Be Happy. And his movie from a few years ago is Sing Over Me. And there's a book by that same title, too. And there's so many other things you could look up about Dennis. But uh, uh, DJ, thanks for being my friend. Love you, Eric. Eternal, immortal, invisible. My Redeemer, my Savior, forever I stand in.